During the Great Irish Famine of 1845 to 1851, over one million people died and about two million immigrated in one of the single most devastating tragedies our country has ever known. I guess I know quite a bit about the uh, Sullivan side of the, the family because my mother has uh, taken an interest in that over the years and has always been telling us about it, you know. But the Hobbs side of the family really is a bit of a fog because, uh, you know, my father's died uh, a long time ago, ago now and his brothers are, have passed on and the level of information we had on the Hobbs side was really quite thin, it's just a big blank. Eddie wants to know more about where the Hobbs were during the famine. So he has travelled to Cork in the hope that his mother Elizabeth can shed further light on the paternal side of his family. <laughs> you were great, eh? Oh, we did, yeah. So far, so good, I know. Oh, it does look like it was raining. Yeah, yeah. And who's that now? That's your, um... This is taken this is, in 1911? Yes, your grandfather, yeah. That's Pop Hobbs. Is that right? W.A. Hobbs. W.A. Yeah. That's Dad's father. That's right. My God, I've never seen a photograph of him. Mm, sure. No. This is what if you took up? No, yeah. your dad. Yeah, I know. I've seen this one before. Yeah. yeah, he was a beautiful baby, weren't you? I was sure I was. I was, huge eyes. I was gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Going on sixty three, early sixty three. Yeah, and you you had colic for six months, and you cried nonstop. Yeah, I got all my crying out of the way when I was young. <laughs> 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 That's your dad when he was a member of the commercial travellers. During the 1970s, Eddie's dad began to battle with long-term depression and eventually died of a heart attack. The younger members of the family wouldn't have known him at all as he was. Like yeah. he, he was if you go out there to a party, people would turn around to me and say, um, <clears throat> gosh, you, you must be all laughing all the time, you know. But with comedians, you see, they go the opposite way. Mm. And... Um, he wasn't the same at home. He was just starting to get on well there. I remember that holiday. That was, in, uh, that was in Glen Bay. Yeah. Yeah. I find that uh, quite a pregnant photograph. Mm. You know, because really that was the end of... That was the end of the... Uh, that was the beginning of the end, really, for him, wasn't it? Start of a tough, a long, a long, old heart. Tough road for you, too. Tough, yeah. Yeah. It, it was very hard to establish any type of relationship, you know, because of the nature of his illness. Uh, so there was always that sense of, of uh, something left undone. And uh, his brothers as well uh, died young, and so did his sisters, um, for various reasons. Uh, so really, um, as, an, as, an, as, an, as an adult, I not now as a young man, you know, 18, 19 years, but as an adult, um, really, uh, we'd, we'd lost them all. So we'd lost that link uh, to the past. Eddie has gone home to Cork to find out more about what the city was like in the 1840s. Here at Cork Port, trade continued at a high level throughout the famine years. At the end of the 18th century, more than half, of all Irish butter exports were coming through uh, the butter market, which had set up quality control. In Cork? For, in, in Cork, yeah, they, yeah. In, in yeah. Cork. And at the end of the 18th century as well, brewing was becoming significant. Uh, oh, there's a shock. Distilling. There's a shock indeed. These buildings up, up along here, that's where the middle classes started to develop. That's right. We can see it, the, the buildings yeah. up there, very different to the slums and tenements of, of the cramped inner city. So the middle classes were able to look at the activity of the port watch their merchandise coming in and going out, and then cast their eyes into the city centre uh, to see what was, you know, at a distance, what was happening in the, in the tenements and slums and the, and the death of thousands of fellow citizens. Precisely. If you're at the other end of the scale and you're looking out at this, clearly uh, it's not a very pleasant sight to see food being exported. 
and there were food riots, food disturbances, not only in Cork but in many other towns, um, riots, disturbances going on and occasionally the military opened fire, uh, people were shot, people were wounded, some people were killed. Interesting letter here from uh, a Cork merchant Cummins to the Duke of Wellington, 1846, 17 to December. He says here that his land, it is situated on the eastern side of Castlehaven Harbour and is named South Reen in the parish of Moiras. And I have a holiday home in Moiras. So it's right, uh, right smack bang in the middle of Mr. Cummins' uh, land. Goes on to say, in the first six famished and ghastly skeletons, to all appearance dead, were huddled in a corner on some filthy straw, their sole covering what seemed a ragged horse cloth and their wretched legs hanging about naked above the knees. I approached in horror and found by a low moaning they were alive, they were in fever, four children and a woman and what had once been a man. It is impossible to go through the details. Suffice to say that in a few minutes I was surrounded by at least 200 of such phantoms, such frightful spectres that no words can describe. By far the greater number were delirious, either from famine or fever. Their demonic yells are still ringing in my ears and their horrible images are fixed upon my brain. My heart sickens at the recital, but I must go on. Interesting, it finishes with a plea which I've just spotted. It says, um, once more, my Lord Duke, in the name of starving thousands, I implore you, break the frigid and flimsy chain of official etiquette and save the land of your birth. The kindred of that gallant Irish blood, which you so often seen lavished to support the honor of the British name, and let there be inscribed upon your tomb, Servata Hibernia. Ireland was preserved by me. Eddie's great-grandfather, John Hobbs, worked in the butter market as a teenager during the famine years and later progressed to be waymaster there. This brings Eddie to the Cork City archives to delve into the butter market records of the time. What I found here uh, is quite interesting. It's dated the 2nd of August, 1838, so it's pre-famine and it is a monthly meeting of the Committee of Merchants who are overseeing the butter market. And uh, it, there's a resolution, and, uh, and it names the people present at the meeting. And the resolution is that the application of Mr. Hobbs for the compensation uh, usually given him of £10 for his extra services, whatever the, they, they were, be taken into consideration at the next monthly meeting. So that firmly puts both... Um, John Hobbs Sr. and John Hobbs Jr. basically involved in the same business in Cork. Given the times that were in it, the fact that they actually had a profession uh, involved with the, uh, with the butter market uh, obviously uh, meant that um, their, family, uh, their families avoided the worst ravages of the famine in Cork at the time. There's a sense of making a connection with the people that have gone before you and, and getting to know them as personalities in so far as you can. And also to learn more on a, on a kind of a ground level, really, and what happened in Cork at the time of the famine, because you really don't get a sense of what it was like at the coal face from history books. You really have to go into personal histories to get a sense, I think, of, um, of what actually happened at the time. What I discovered, to my surprise, was that the family roots go way back, uh, much further back than I thought, to the lock, right back to uh, my great-great-grandfather, John Hobbs, I suppose it would bind you closer to a place. My great-grandfather, John Hobbs, who would have been a teenager here during the time of the famine. So we'd have to travel over the top of Lock Hill here, up towards the butter market. He would have been walking through and breathing in the air and the smells and the difficulties around the famine and watching people die, you know, keel over and so on. Having walked the route his great-grandfather would have taken into work, Eddie continues on to the butter market. Here at the butter market, how big was it at, at the time? Well, at the time they were talking about, it would have been clearly the largest market of its type in the world. Okay. 
Every day here at about 11 o'clock, as you probably know, the price of butter was fixed by the Committee of Merchants. And when t- telegraphy was introduced in the middle of the 19th century, almost within minutes of that price being a- arranged, it was telegraphed to commodity markets in London, Paris, and in New York. So right. the price of cork butter, in effect, became the price of world butter. That's mm. its, if you like, its global impact at the time. An ancestor of mine was a waymaster here for a long time. Well, he wasn't a waymaster originally. He kind of mm. elevated mm. to become a waymaster. And what was the job of the waymaster? Well, the waymaster, I suppose, in today's parlance, would be midway between, I suppose, an executive director and a CEO. Mm. He was very much the public face of the market. He'd be a very sharp operator. Mm. He would have had a very, very good head for figures. I think that's probably something strong in your right, family. Okay. But I think also he would have been a man of integrity. There's somebody you have to believe in, somebody that you trust. The people who ran the, the committee of merchants would have had to have complete trust in him. So a typical day then would start very early and finish very late, would it? Because of the... Well, it's a 24-hour oh, market. 24 hours, because the farmers coming originally on their carts for some of them it might have been a three-day round trip so they could be here three or four o'clock in the morning and also if you think of the life of the market mm. people stayed here in in, uh, in boarding houses and in pubs and I was going to say there must have been, it must have been festooned with pubs and yes, crack indeed. and boarding houses and then we had the famine of course in the, in the mm. middle of all of that but, and a, a lot of the effects of the famine in Cork would have been here just off Shandon Street yes. it must have been an extraordinary mm. mix of this huge worldwide market and literally around the corner Yes, well, I mean, you probably see a similar scene in a third world country today where there are such enormous extremes between wealth and, 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 and disadvantage. Clearly, the, uh, the Hobbs family were, were not affected in terms of death by the famine, but they, you know, they must have been affected by the deaths of, of people they, they got to know because, after all, uh, they were living on, you know, side by side with the whole network of people off the lanes and Barrack Street and Shandon Street. So, I mean, they were, fa- they were faced with that like everybody else, you know. And I'd imagine that, um, you know, outside of the, the natural tendency to normalise it, you know, as it, as it goes on, uh, it must have, um, you know, it must have created a pall really over, over everybody's lives at the time, you know. We know that Eddie's great-grandfather had been a teenager during the famine working in the butter market. But how would that experience affect him in later life? What Eddie is about to discover is that not only did the family survive the famine, but must have thrived economically after it. This is the the last will and testament of me, John Hobbs of 14 Lock Road, waymaster and all that, revoking his previous wills and testaments, which is classic stuff. On his death in 1920, John left substantial assets to his wife and children, including life insurance, and seven houses on the Loch Road, ten houses on Gould Street, and a house on Bandon Street. You can see, Eddie, that he, that, that he clearly had uh, a game plan. By the time of his will, yeah. uh, he has 20 houses to his name. Uh, he had a rental income from these on top of his, uh, mm. his, uh, his salary from the butter market. A waymaster would have been paid about £110 sterling. So that's quite a substantial wage, roughly four times the average industrial wage. So I think, he, I think he'd made fairly shrewd investments. Okay. Ultimately, he was left with uh, seven properties, which he passed on. So uh, I think, you know, he obviously knew his onions when it came, right, to, okay. came to finances. Right, OK. All of us think that, uh, that, that who we are really is a function of the experiences we've, we've had in our own lives. And it isn't really, you know. I mean, um, when, when, you, when, when I look back into my own family, you begin to understand uh, that you're, you're actually made up of the, the building blocks of who you are, are made up of these people that have gone before you. And, um, and so going, going and finding out about them, in, in a way, uh, you're actually finding out a large part of who you are yourself. I suppose it's, it's, it's remarkable to, um, you know, recall or visualise, you know, what actually happened here. You know, the, the, the brutality of it, being brought in in sacks and just um, thrown together in a big hole in the ground and covered up. They must have had layer upon layer upon layer. The register shows that they were burying from 7 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock at night constantly. Uh, 
It also shows, uh, you know, where we where <laughs> where we all end up at the end, regardless of uh, how much wealth you build you build for yourself. The poorest of the poor, the richest of the rich. Daffodils instead of headstones. <laughs>